Welcome. Welcome to my workshop. I'm Jim. Today I want to share with you what I've learned about the descent and landing profile of a 737-800. In particular, I want to look at the effect of a tailwind. Suppose we're flying a 737-800 and are coming to the end of the cruise at an altitude of 35,000 feet. Our objective is to land at this airport. The first question is how far back we should begin the descent. There's a rule of thumb to calculate this. The rule begins by striking out the thousands in the altitude. Multiplying by three then gives the distance in nautical miles. If the top of descent is 35,000 feet, then the descent should begin 105 nautical miles out. I'm going to use a graph to be more precise. The vertical axis on the graph shows the altitude and the horizontal axis shows the distance in nautical miles away from the airport. We'll start the descent at 35,000 feet and 105 nautical miles. The black line is a straight line connecting the top of descent with the airport. In an ideal world, we would fly straight down this line. After landing, this line would turn out to be our track made good in the vertical plane. It happens that the elevation angle of this line is 3.14 degrees. A good instrument airspeed for the descent would be 250 knots, and the rate of descent will be between 1,500 and 2,000 feet per minute. I'm going to look first at the case where there is no wind aloft. I'll use red dots to show the progress of the flight if the selected rate of descent is 1,500 feet per minute. The red dots are spaced one minute apart. The airplane will pass through 30,000 feet, about four and a half minutes into the descent. After 10 minutes, the plane will be down to 20,000 feet. It will also be a little bit below the geometric track. The plane will pass through 15,000 feet, about 14 minutes into the descent. If the descent was continued below 10,000 feet, the airplane would reach 5,000 feet at the 20 minute mark. Don't be alarmed. We'll start on the approach before we let the descent get this far. I want to run through another descent using the higher rate of descent 2,000 feet per minute, still assuming no wind. I'll use blue dots for this run. Once again, the dots are spaced one minute apart. Obviously, with a higher rate of descent, the airplane's track will be even farther below the geometric track. The plane will be at 15,000 feet 10 minutes into the descent. Compare this to the 20,000 feet the plane was at 10 minutes into the descent at only 1,500 feet per minute. Continuing on, the plane will be down to 5,000 feet in 15 minutes. Despite being so far below the desired geometric track, Descending at 2,000 feet per minute is not crazy. Suppose we'd been descending at 2,000 feet per minute but entered into an altitude hold at 15,000 feet. After a minute in the hold, we'd be here. I've shown the holding trajectory with square dots, once again spaced one minute apart. Five minutes into the hold, we'd be here, just above the geometric track. If we now resume the descent at 2,000 feet per minute, will drift back below the geometric track as shown. Descending at 2,000 feet per minute makes sense if we expect to hold for five minutes or so. Roughly speaking, the objective during the descent is to get us to this point. This is a good place to start the approach. It's an altitude of 10,000 feet, a distance 30 nautical miles out from the airport. Now, what if there's a tailwind at higher altitudes? Once again, suppose that we're coming to the end of the cruise at an altitude of 35,000 feet as before. This time, we expect to enjoy a 20 knot tailwind on the way down. The calculation starts off as before, with the TOD distance calculated at the rate of three nautical miles for each thousand feet of altitude. This time though, we had a correction factor of two nautical miles for each 10 knots of tailwind. Since the tailwind is 20 knots, we would add 4 nautical miles to the descent distance. We would start the descent a little earlier than before, at 109 nautical miles out. With no winds at altitude, we start the descent here, 105 nautical miles away from the airport. With a 20 knot tailwind, we start down 4 nautical miles earlier. 
the geometric track from the top of descent to the airport is now 3.03 degrees, a little bit smaller than before. There's a huge advantage to correcting for a tailwind by adjusting the starting distance for the top of descent. The advantage is this. We can make the descent using the same pitch and power settings as for the no wind case. We don't have to adjust the pitch and power for the wind. Adjusting the descent distance takes care of the tailwind effect. Let me demonstrate this. I will keep the pitch and power settings as they were before those that result in an instrument airspeed of 250 knots and a rate of descent between 1500 and 2000 feet per minute. Once again, I've used red dots to show the true location in the vertical plane every minute during the descent. The airplane will be down to 10,000 feet after 17 minutes, just a shade below the geometric track. I will now repeat the descent for the higher rate of 2000 feet per minute using blue dots. The vertical track made good includes a 5 minute hold at 15,000 feet and then a continued descent at 2,000 feet per minute. About 17 and a half minutes into the descent, the airplane will pass through the target point. The target point is 30 nautical miles out at 10,000 feet, which is a great place from which to begin the approach. I'm now going to look at the approach phase and I'll start with a clean slate. I'll also assume for now a no wind condition. If the descent went well, then the airplane will be at an altitude of 10,000 feet, a distance of 30 nautical miles away from the airport. The elevation of the geometric approach path is 3.14 degrees, exactly the same as it was for the no wind descent. 140 knots would be a typical instrument airspeed during the approach, with the rate of descent between 700 and 750 feet per minute. I'll start down first at a rate of descent of 700 feet per minute. I'll record the track using red dots. Because the distance scale is larger than it was before, I've reduced the spacing between the dots to 30 seconds, so that each minute now needs two dots. The plane will pass through 6,000 feet in about 6 minutes, and through 3,000 feet in about 10 minutes. The track made good is a little bit above the geometric line. I will now run the approach again, this time at the higher rate of descent, 750 feet per minute, showing blue dots every 30 seconds. The actual track this time is very close to the geometric line. Now, the objective during the approach is to get to this point, which is 5 nautical miles out and at an altitude of 1600 feet. This is a good point from which to start down on final. Now. I have not rerun the approach phase of the flight for different tailwinds or headwinds. Since we will likely have to make some heading changes during the approach, the wind we experience will not necessarily be constant. If we're lucky even, and the approach includes a 180 degree turn, then the effect of the wind might even cancel itself out during the approach. However, things get more interesting when we start down on final. To show the final, I've zeroed in on the last 5 nautical miles to the airport, and I've assumed we'll start our final at an altitude of 1600 feet. If we are visual, then we're going to pick a fixed reference point on the ground, somewhere near the threshold. We might use the Pappy lights for this purpose. So long as we then keep the Pappy lights at a fixed position in the windscreen, we will be moving directly towards the Pappies and hopefully towards a good touchdown. The geometric line connecting the start of the final and the Pappy lights has an elevation angle of 3.02 degrees. Note that the geometric lines all the way down from the top of descent have been a succession of tracks with elevation angles just over 3 degrees. And this continues on final. Good basic settings for the final are an instrument airspeed of 140 knots and a rate of descent of 750 feet per minute. I'm going to run the first final assuming no wind. Each dot now represents 5 seconds of elapsed time. The airplane will pass through 800 feet after a minute. At the 2 minute mark it will be down to 100 feet. I've terminated the final at this point assuming that we're getting ready to flare. The red line marks 100 feet and I will use this height for comparisons with the next couple of runs. I'm now going to run a second final, this time assuming a tailwind at 10 knots. I'm going to use the same pitch and power settings as in the no wind case. 
As before, the instrument airspeed and the rate of descent will be 140 knots and 750 feet per minute, respectively. The tailwind is pushing us forward, so our track made good lies above the geometric line. Whoops, this doesn't look good. Once we reach the 100-foot mark, we are more than 1,000 feet past the pappies. Things get worse if we keep the same pitch and power settings with a 15-knot tailwind. By the time we get down to 100 feet, we're more than 1,500 feet long. For the sake of comparison, I've run a third final, this time with a 20-knot headwind, and still keeping the same pitch and power settings. We end up short by more than 2,000 feet. We can extract from these graphs a useful relationship. If we keep the no-wind pitch and power settings on final, then a 10-knot tailwind will fly us 1,000 feet long. A 15-knot tailwind will make us 1,500 feet long. A 20-knot headwind will leave us 2,000 feet short. The rule of thumb is that we will end up 1,000 feet long or short for every 10 knots of tailwind or headwind on final. Since the Pappy lights are such a handy ground reference, it's useful to see what they can tell us. The center line of the Pappy beam will be aimed through the point I assumed would be the start of our final, that is 1,600 feet, 5 nautical miles out. The inner Pappy beam has an angular width of exactly 1 degree. Pilots who are below this inner beam will see four reds. Pilots above the beam will see four whites. The inner beam is subdivided into three equal thirds, each subtending an angle of 20 minutes. Remember that one degree is 60 minutes, so these three 20-minute subbeams add up to one degree of arc. An airplane in the central third will see two whites and two reds. An airplane in the lower third will see three reds, and an airplane in the upper third will see three whites. I will now superimpose this Pappy profile on top of the vertical tracks for the three finals we just flew. With a tailwind, either 10 knots or 15 knots, the airplane will pass out of the Pappy's inner beam right about here. The Pappy will then show four whites. For the record, this transition will occur about one and a half nautical miles from touchdown. Of course, we will have observed the transition from two whites to three whites even before this. With a 20-knot headwind, the airplane will have passed into four reds about two and a half nautical miles from touchdown. Obviously, landing with a headwind or tailwind requires a change of behavior. To be more precise, the pitch and power settings cannot be left at their no-wind values. Let's take a look at what has to change. This graph looks a lot like the ones above. It's intended to, but there are important differences. The vertical axis is not altitude. Instead, it's the rate of descent in feet per minute. The horizontal axis is no longer the distance from the airport. Instead, it's the horizontal speed in knots. This particular graph is going to summarize the no-wind situation. I ran the no-wind final with a rate of descent of 750 feet per minute and an instrument airspeed of 140 knots. The graph shows the vector addition of the velocities in the vertical plane. The horizontal component needed to complete the right triangle is the ground speed, 139.8 knots. Since there's no wind, the airplane's speed vector with respect to the ground will be the same as its speed vector with respect to the air. The angle of descent, both with respect to the air and with respect to the ground, is 3.03 degrees. This angle will take us right down the desired geometric track to the Pappy lights. Consider now a 10-knot tailwind. If we repeat the final with the same pitch and power settings, which give a rate of descent of 350 feet per minute and an airspeed of 140, then the horizontal component of the airspeed will be the same as before, 139.8 knots. But that won't be the ground speed. We have to add the prevailing 10-knot tailwind. Although the descent angle with respect to the air is still 3.03 degrees, the descent angle with respect to the ground is less. It's only 2.81 degrees. Hence, we overshoot. To counteract the tailwind, we need to achieve a steeper angle of descent with respect to the air. We can get that by increasing the rate of descent, or by decreasing the airspeed, or by doing some of both. 
Let's try increasing the rate of descent first. Let's increase the rate of descent to 804 feet per minute while keeping the airspeed as before. Then add the 10 knot tailwind. That will result in a ground speed of 149.8 knots. The true airspeed relative to ground is the yellow vector. It has an elevation angle of 3.03 degrees, which will fly us straight down the required geometric track. Now let's try the other strategy, decreasing the airspeed. These black arrows are the no wind vectors. This time we'll keep the rate of descent at 750, but decrease the instrument airspeed to 130.02 knots. As an aside, the extra precision in the .02 of airspeed may be unjustified, but I don't want to cause any misunderstanding when doing the vector addition. Adding the tailwind makes our ground speed 139.8 knots and results in the true airspeed shown by the yellow vector. The true descent vector in the vertical plane has the required elevation angle. Now let's consider the 15 knot tailwind. The black vectors are the no wind settings. If we correct for the tailwind by increasing the rate of descent, then we'll have to increase it to 830 feet per minute. We'll keep the instrument airspeed at 140 knots. When we add the tailwind, we get a ground speed of 154.8 knots. The yellow vector is the true airspeed with respect to the ground, and it has the required elevation angle. The only fly in this ointment is that the rate of descent of 830 feet per minute is 11% higher than the 750 feet per minute we'd like to achieve. We need to take care to avoid a hard landing. Let's try it again, but this time correct for the tailwind by decreasing the airspeed. As before, the no wind vectors are shown in black. I'll keep the rate of descent at 750 feet per minute, but decrease the airspeed to 125.02 knots. When we add the tailwind, we get a ground speed of 139.8 knots. The yellow vector is our true track, and it has the required elevation angle. However, as the airspeed decreases, there's a greater chance of experiencing some wobbles. Let's look at the 20 knot headwind, starting again with the no wind vectors. We can reduce the rate of descent to 643 feet per minute while keeping the airspeed at 140 knots. The tailwind will propel us backwards, reducing our ground speed to only 119.9 knots. The vertical track made good, once again shown in yellow, has the required 3.03 .03 degree slope. Alternatively, in the face of a headwind, we can speed up. We can keep the rate of descent at 750 feet per minute, but increase the instrument airspeed to just under 160 knots. The headwind will blow us backwards, resulting in a ground speed of 139.8 knots. The true track, shown in yellow as before, has the required angle. That's it for today. Note that this is a real photograph. Just look at that nose wheel.